Today we see Jacob find out about his long lost and presumed dead son Joseph before packing his household for a move to Egypt on The Bible Brief. The Prime Minister of Egypt has revealed that he's none other than the long-lost brother of the men who'd come from Canaan to buy food. After Judah's passionate and contrite speech telling of God's judgment on the brothers and of their father's state, Joseph breaks down and weeps, weeping for the years apart from his brothers and apart from his aging father, a father he desperately wants to see before Jacob dies. Joseph, though, can't go to his father and forsake his ministerial duties in Egypt. Instead, he sends his brothers back to Canaan with a rich caravan of goods and gifts to his father's house. He instructs them to tell his father that Joseph, his son, says this to him, God has made me Lord of all of Egypt. Come down to me and do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, and your flocks and your herds and all that you have. There I will provide for you, for there are yet five years of famine to come so that you and your household and all that you have do not come to poverty. It's with this message that the brothers return with a large caravan back to Canaan, back to their father Jacob, back to deliver a message to their father, to whom they delivered a bloody robe 22 years prior. You have to think that they had quite the conversation on their journey back through the Sinai Peninsula all the way to Canaan. How would Jacob take the news? Would it be joy at learning about Joseph, or anger at the realization of former deception by the brothers? Would the stress of the revelation of Joseph's life in Egypt be too much for the old man? Well, soon they had an answer to their question. We read this in Genesis chapter 45, starting in verse 25. So they went up out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to their father Jacob. And they told him, Joseph is still alive, and he is ruler over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart became numb, for he did not believe them. But when they told him all the words of Joseph which he had said to them, and when Jacob saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. And Israel said, It is enough. Joseph my son is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. After the initial shock at the revelation about Joseph, Jacob looks over the wagons and animals that came back with his sons, and he realizes that his sons could have never come back with this wealth were it not for the generosity of someone else. Coupled with the claims of his sons, he concludes, It's enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. We're not told of any confession by the brothers, nor of any reprimand by their father. Instead, the Bible summarizes this conversation with the simple conclusion that Jacob would now leave for Egypt to see his son. But something lingered in the mind of Jacob, something that should perhaps be lingering in our minds too. Would Jacob forsake the land that had been promised to his grandfather Abraham, his father Isaac, and to himself? Would he go to Egypt as his grandfather Abraham had done before he was sent away by Pharaoh? There was almost certainly some anxiety and fear in Jacob's mind, and we know that because of what happens next. So Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. And God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt. For there I will make you into a great nation. I myself will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also bring you up again. And Joseph's hand shall close your eyes as you die. On his way to Egypt, and for the final time in Jacob's life, God appears to him before he leaves the land of Canaan. And God says to Jacob that he need not be afraid of going down to Egypt, because it will be in Egypt that God will expand the nation's population before bringing the nation back to Canaan in the future. And God reassures Jacob that he will indeed make it to see Joseph before he dies. So with new vigor and promise we read, 
Then Jacob set out from Beersheba. The sons of Israel carried Jacob their father, their little ones and their wives, and the wagons that Pharaoh had sent to carry him. And they also took their livestock and their goods which they had gained in the land of Canaan, and came into Egypt. Jacob and all his offspring with him, his sons and his sons' sons with him, his daughters and his sons' daughters. All his offspring he brought with him into Egypt. All the persons of the house of Jacob who came into Egypt were seventy. And soon, after the large caravan of the small nation of Israel arrives, they come to the area of Goshen within Egypt. And Joseph comes to his elderly father for a sweet reunion after decades apart. We read that Joseph prepared his chariot and went up to meet Israel, his father, in Goshen. He presented himself and fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. Israel said to Joseph, Now let me die, since I have seen your face and know that you are still alive. Jacob's final hope had been to see Joseph before he died. And now having seen Joseph face to face, he's content to die. His eleven sons had become twelve yet again. He could now try to enjoy the rest of his days with the satisfaction of reunion and reunification among all his house and his sons. But despite his contentment, Jacob's story isn't quite over. Because soon, Jacob has an audience with Pharaoh himself. Let's listen in Genesis 47. Pharaoh said to Joseph, Your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is before you. Settle your father and your brothers in the best of the land. Let them settle in the land of Goshen. And if you know any able men among them, put them in charge of my livestock. Then Joseph brought Jacob his father and stood him before Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Jacob, How many are the days of the years of your life? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, The days of the years of my sojourning are one hundred and thirty years. Few and difficult have been the days of the years of my life, and they have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their sojourning. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from the presence of Pharaoh. Here we see an amazing and interesting interaction. As the elderly Jacob shows his superiority and eminence before Pharaoh, in a gesture of goodwill to Pharaoh, he blesses Pharaoh and then says an odd statement of reflection on his own life. He says that the days of his life have been few and difficult, and haven't been lengthened like his forefathers. In saying this, we see at least a small reflection of Jacob on his own life. A life of deceiving and being deceived. A life of struggling for blessing, struggling for wives, struggling for herds and wealth, struggling with God and finally struggling with his sons in their sinful ways. His life has been difficult, and compared to faithful Abraham, his life has been short. Abraham died in a good old age in the promised land of Canaan, while Jacob would spend his few remaining days outside of that land. But despite being away from the land of promise, the rest of his life wouldn't be all bad. He would settle with his small nation in the best of the land of Egypt. We read this. Then Joseph settled his father and his brothers, and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had commanded. And Joseph provided his father, his brothers, and all his father's household with food, according to the number of their dependents. This area called Ramses, or Goshen, would be the dwelling place of the nation of Israel the place that God has provided through the generosity of Pharaoh. This would be the place where this little family of 70 would become a great nation, a fertile land for flocks that would bless the family as they waited to return to the promised land of Canaan. But lest we forget, we're only two years into the seven years of famine that God had revealed to Pharaoh in his dream. Not even halfway through. And in the coming years, we find that the political and social structure of the nation of Egypt changes drastically under Joseph's leadership. Let's continue reading about the remaining five years of famine. Now there was no food in all the land, for the famine was very severe, so that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished by reason of the famine. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt 
and in the land of Canaan in exchange for the grain that they bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. And when all the money was spent in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us food. Why should we die before your eyes? For our money is gone. And Joseph answered, Give your livestock, and I will give you food in exchange for your livestock if your money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph. And Joseph gave them food in exchange for the horses, the flocks, the herds, and the donkeys. He supplied them food in exchange for all their livestock that year. And when that year was ended, they came the following year and said to him, Buy us and our land for food, and we with our land will be servants to Pharaoh, and give us seed that we may not die, and that the land may not be desolate. So Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for all the Egyptians sold their field, because the famine was severe on them. The land became Pharaoh's. As for the people, he made servants of them from one end of Egypt to the other. Only the land of priests he did not buy, for the priests had a fixed allowance from Pharaoh and lived on the allowance that Pharaoh gave them. Therefore they did not sell their land. Okay, so in the remaining years of the famine,